Hi, Mavs. It is so good to see you today. I am really excited. This is the last day in our umbrella or theme of talking about why authors write books. And so we've spent the last two days talking about the first two reasons. One, to entertain. Yesterday was to inform. And today is key to persuade. So find that learning target. Get your bow and arrow out. And two, one, two. I can understand that sometimes the author's purpose is to get me to think the way that he or she does about a topic or to do something a certain way. Woo! Now, Mavs, it's really important to think about that, right? If you know that the author's purpose is to get you to think change your thinking or to act a certain way, you can think about the argument that he or she makes to support their opinion and in their ability to change or support your thinking. So we have the three books today. We're going to use giant pandas, frogs, and dolphins. Let's begin. So remember maps. Yesterday, and we already just said this, right? But we just said that we have the three reasons. So today, the type we are talking about is to persuade. And when you are trying to decide whether the author's purpose was to persuade, you need to think about, did the author try to convince me or persuade me to do something? Does the author want me to change my opinion? And if it's one of these two things, then you know that the author wrote this book in order to change someone's thinking or get someone to take action on a cause. So let's go into Seymour Simon. So I want you to think, I'm, like I said before, I'm going to read a few of the pages, just like we always do. I'm not going to read the whole book, but we are going to read a few pages of this book. Okay, and a lot of times in nonfiction books, we might have some information on the back that might help us to understand what the author's purpose was. So if you read this book, and if we go through, if you remember, this is a longer book, right? Seymour Simon is a very famous nonfiction writer, and he uses... Um, a lot of people who can help support and help give him ideas and information on um, the topics and animals that he writes about. So here, a lot of this, right, is just this expository text that really talks about all the information and gives you this deeper understanding of the amazingness of frogs. It teaches you about their life cycles, the different kinds of frogs all over the world. It helps us to understand um, places that they live, shows them as babies. So as you read, you start to become fascinated and hopefully start to build this relationship and an adoration in the amazingness of frogs, right? And so you could say, I think the author's purpose was to inform. Okay, but there's a difference in this book than there was in some of the other books. And this difference is found on the last several pages. So I want you to look. This is um, towards the very end of the book. So many times you're going to have to read the whole book in order to understand the full purpose. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read this, these last two pages together. Climate change and global warming may have affected frogs' ability to keep their bodies cool and wet enough. Because frogs absorb water through their skin, they are at risk of dying from water pollution and acid rain. Chemicals, fertilizers, sewage runoff, and other kinds of man-made pollution threaten frogs. The number of frogs is declining in many places around the world. A major worldwide threat to frogs today is citric fungus. The fungus feeds on keratin, a substance in frog skin that makes it tough. The fungus does not usually affect tadpoles, but it can kill adult frogs. Scientists think 
that about one third of the world's population may have the fungus. There is no effective treatment. So scientists are trying to quarantine, that's one we know really well now, and keep safe as many frog species as possible in zoos and other facilities. Chytric fungus is a worldwide prog problem, but there are a few things you can do to help spread, stop the spread. You should never release foreign pet frogs into the wild. Released foreign frogs can breed and overwhelm the local frog population. They can also spread disease. If you spot many or sick dead frogs in your area, contact your state or the federal wildlife department and tell them about what you have found. The information may be helpful to scientists studying the problem. And in the back, it talks about this important role that frogs, frogs play in nature. They help control the insect population. They are an important food source for many other animals, such as birds and snakes. And because of their double life as tadpoles in water and adults on land, even common frogs are among the most interesting animals in the world. So Mavs, I want you to think, right? There was a very deliberate purpose that Seymour Simon used in writing this book. Why do you think that Seymour Simon wrote this book? I want you to pause this video if you don't have an answer. And I want you to pause and I want you to answer this question using the step, talking stem that you see right now. Seymour Simon wrote this book because because why? What do you think? What was he trying to encourage you to do? Or the reader to do? Okay. So if you think right here, what does the author want you to think about or do? If we go and look at this text, right? The author wants you to be aware of the climate change. And that's a larger conversation. The author wants you to be aware of their declining numbers and a very dangerous fungus that is having effects on the population. And the author wants you, if you have a pet frog, to never release a pet into the wild. So they did all of this work helping you to build your adoration to really think, wow, I love frogs. They are super awesome, right? And then Seymour Simon had a message for his reader. And that message really helped the reader to understand what Seymour's purpose was, that people should stop the spread of a fungus that is harming frogs, right? He really wants that to happen. He wants us to know at the end that frogs are important. Okay. So did he do, I want you to think, and that's that question that you ask yourself, did he do a good job of convincing you? Yeah, right? I would do things that I could to help stop a fungus that's harmful to frogs. I would make sure that I would not release a frog into the wild because now he's persuaded me, he has informed me that if I do that, I could endanger entire populations of frogs. When I wasn't even thinking that, I was just thinking of freeing my pet frog. Okay, and he convinced me that I need to do what I can to help frogs because frogs are important. They are important to our entire balance in our um, ecosystem, right? From birds and other species that feed on frogs to the frog's ability to keep our insect populations down. So authors like Seymour Simon write informational text in order to help you or encourage you or persuade you to do something or to think a certain way. Let's look at dolphins now. The next book here, and this is another one from Seymour Simon. So you're going to notice, just like we did when we read the whole book, right, a similarities between, and this is because they are written by the same author. 
up here. So when an author wants you to think a certain way, the author is trying to persuade you. So I want you to think about what does Seymour Simon try to persuade you to either do or think in this book. And similar to the context and content of dolphins, or I'm sorry, frogs, okay, Seymour Simon becomes, before he gets to his real purpose, so this is why we were talking. Sometimes you can, if I had only read three or four pages of this book, then perhaps I would say, well, of course it's to inform Mrs. Hampstead because they're teaching me. They teach me um, how much dolphins weigh, what the difference between dolphins and tortoises are, how many species of dolphins, all of these amazing things that help me to fall in love with these beautiful, adorable creatures, okay? Beautiful photographs and imagery, lots of fun details, okay? And here I am again. He has the same structure, which is something that we've talked about, right? When you have similar authors, or the same author writing similar stories, Sometimes we might notice similarities between the text, which is what we do today. So again, this is the last. There's one more page on the back. Okay. The greatest threats to dolphins and porpoises are still pollution and careless commercial net fishing. Scientists think that increased levels of garbage and industrial waste washing into the sea helps create a red tide. A red tide is a result of the rapid growth of sea plankton that produce a kind of poison. Fish eat the poison and dolphins eat the fish and die. Again, it talks you back to that pollution. People are the greatest threat to dolphins, but people can also help dolphins the most. If you buy tuna that is labeled dolphin safe on the can, and commercial tuna fishermen will use safety nets that don't accidentally ensnare dolphins. The United States Congress passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act to protect whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Here are some things that we can all do. Put beach litter into a trash container. If you are in a boat when you spot dolphins, ask the driver to slow down and avoid turning or reversing suddenly. Do not harass dolphins. And don't pursue them if they leave. Help beach dolphins and, por and porpoises by calling the local police, aquarium, or department con of conservation. Lastly, write letters to government officials asking them to strengthen the protection of animals. So again, very deliberate and explicit in his purpose. Seymour S Simon wrote this book because he... People are the greatest threat to dolphins, but people can also help dolphins the most. And he gave us a list of many things that we can do to help dolphins. Now, again, this is a great opportunity for you to think critically about, am I convinced? Did the author give support and evidence to help persuade me to do or act on something? For me, the answer is yes. So I'm going to skip this because I feel like we're going a little bit longer, and that's totally fine. So here's your job today. When you read today, I really want you to think about the author's purpose. Does the author want to persuade or convince me? Does the author want to entertain me? Or does the author want me to teach me about something? I am super excited, and I'm really wondering if anyone is going to be able to find a book that tries to persuade. All right, Mavs, I'm really excited to see. Be sure that when you add your, your response into Seesaw, that you have used sticky, mark, sticky notes to mark the page that helps you to know the author's main purpose. All right, Mavs, great job. See you next time.